Okay. Um, so my guest today is Shay Yakiwowo. Um, Shay is the a founder and executive director of Glitch. She's won too many awards to uh, properly acknowledge uh, without embarrassing her and us. Um, but take it from me, this is a wildly accomplished person who you're about to hear from. Um, and so Shay, I'd like to start by just setting out um, the problem that caused you to found Glitch and then what Glitch seeks to do. And then we're going to go down a, you know, a complex rabbit hole of how difficult and intractable a problem it is and what we can do and what we can't do and what government will have to do in order to properly address this problem. But tell us about the problem and tell us about Glitch. Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Paul. Um, it's really great to be part of this lunchtime session. I'm one of the Impact Fellows, so I'm um, very blessed to be a member of the Conduit um, and looking forward to coming back on the 20th of July and seeing people face to face, obviously at a social distance. Um, so Glitch, sometimes I reference as my oops baby because um, I never intended to set up Glitch three years ago. Um, the problem, as you mentioned, Paul, that Based, caused me or forced me to set up Glitch was receiving online abuse myself. So I was an elected politician at the time at the age of 23. A video of a speech that I made about racial justice um, at the European Parliament went viral um, and it was fine. I thought, yes, I'm going to get invited to the Ellen show. I'm going to get free hair. I'm going to get free makeup. Idris Elba's finally going to follow me back on Twitter. Like none of that happened. I'm still waiting for Idris to follow me back. Um, but what did happen uh, was, um, it was the video was posted on a neo-Nazi website and then I became uh, horrifically trolled um, relentlessly for like a period of like weeks across many different platforms. And the problem wasn't just the abuse, it was the lack of response from the social media platforms itself. There was no response actually. Three years ago it was you had made a report and Twitter didn't even have to acknowledge that you made a report. Um, you had police teams who were trying their very best to try and help me build a case, but wanted me to, um, to push a case as a black person, not as a black woman, because there was no legislation around uh, online harassment of, of, for women or misogyny as a hate crime. So I, the only levers I had was being black, I meaning I had to kind of separate myself as a black woman, right? Um, and then the problem was wider society. There was a lot of victim blaming language being used. Well, you should have said that, or you're in politics, what do you expect? I just felt like we had made such progress with championing or ending uh, violence against women offline that we were repeating the same rhetoric online now. Um, uh, and I felt like people were not understanding that all forms of violence against women and hate speech is part of a continuum offline and we should be making these these distinctions so being the mathy person from east london i was like i'm going to do something about it and so i did a campaign where i did a, a recommendations report literally like what i learned from lsc <laughs> um, when i was studying there just did a report moaning but criticizing weight and providing recommendations on how tech companies could do better to tackle online abuse and harassment and that was very much well received by so many people thanking me for putting to words what they were asking for. I didn't know that we should be calling for that from tech companies. And I felt like I was on, uh, there was something here. And I felt, I knew I wasn't the only person who experienced online abuse. I knew that women were 27 times more likely to be harassed online than, than men. And I knew that there was a real deficit in understanding how black women experience online abuse. So glitch was birthed. Glitch uh, became a charity in February and we, did, we, we do just that. We raise awareness about online abuse and how it has an intersectional impact on different communities. We do advocacy with tech and government because we need to go to the root problem, but we know that legislation and tech accountability can take a long time. So the thing that we do every day, our, dead, our, our bread and butter is providing training and workshops on digital citizenship and on digital self-care and self-defense because I'm the generation that I remember clearly when the big 95, 98 Windows PCs came into our classroom in primary school. No one taught me how to use those IT tools in the right way, in a positive way as a digital citizen. All they did was just keep blocking all of these inappropriate sites and games and we just thought teachers were being boring. 
And so there's a real deficit before COVID of digital citizenship education around people understanding digital security. And we basically plug a hole because there's a massive exodus of people leaving the online space um, because they don't feel safe. And a lot of our online spaces are being hijacked and weaponized by the far right, by incels, by hate movements. And I'm really concerned as well, and I'll end here, I'm really concerned as well for people who are uh, righteously angry for whatever reason that, 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 that they are now being groomed by these hate groups online and there's not being proper thought regulation or support for them. So let's talk about your um, the way you work. Do you focus uh, principally on helping people who would be targets or victims of how to protect themselves and how to do self-care or do you focus on the threat and the perpetrators and how to deal with that. I mean, obviously they're interrelated, but they require two different methodologies to address, I should imagine. You're absolutely right. And we kind of do too. Our primary focus is, the, as you said, is the, the, those that are most likely to be a target of harassment or those who have been and are kind of fearful of joining online spaces, understandably. But we also look at active bystander intervention. That's something that we all can do right now today is understand how we can be active bystanders online the same way we are offline we know what to do when somebody is being hurt we know to call the police we know to safely interject if a woman's been harassed on the sheet there's been so many great campaigns talking about active bystander interventions offline they also apply online when you see abuse and harassment report it reply um, so amplify the original message and just check in to make sure that they're okay that's a way of us being able to make sure that people are not perpetrating, not being part of the problem. Also, when we talk about active bystander interventions and digital citizenship, which is basically the idea that you have rights and responsibilities online, we also raise awareness about online abuse and its intersectional, in intersectional impact because that helps us make sure we're not being a part of the problem. So being an online ally means that you're not thinking that dead naming a trans person, which is basically exposing their previous identity, is, is banter or colorism, which was a huge issue in black Twitter um, five, six, five and six years ago. That was seen as banter as well. When we are able to educate the masses on what online abuse looks like and the various spectrums and tactics and how it disproportionately affects particular communities, we are all now awakened or as people say, woke to those behaviors and making sure that we are not the ones perpetrating that as well. So that seems to me to be an incredible, I mean, I love the idea of, you know, bystanderism, which is to say, you know, the fact that you haven't been victimized yourself doesn't mean that you don't have a moral obligation, that you don't have an ethical imperative to stand up and protect and defend people who have so that you try and create kind of this T cells in the internet, which or online, which which come to people's defence when they're being being attacked. Um, tell us about what you think, because what you're still doing here is both protecting targets and victims, and awakening ordinary citizens to their responsibilities. But before we went live, you were we were also having a chat about the responsibilities of the platforms themselves, the people who monetize our online lives, who derive money from our privacy and from our information, um, and who have up to now, I think it's fair to say, been rather laissez-faire on these questions, willfully so. So tell us how you think about their responsibilities and what is to be done with them in this moment. Yeah. And Paul, I think you, you, you nailed it really quite well. And to do a shameless plug, it's in my TED talk too. Don't wait to be a victim before you start caring about cleaning up the online space. But it's the same way that we don't wait for our community centers to be hijacked or we, the way we see that civic kind of response to when there's gentrification or there is, um, that you know, the schools are, schools are being forced to close or you saw like um, uh, schools not being able to, um, provide um, lunches or whatever it was you know you see that kind of civic response to say look we're not going to tolerate this in our on our public spaces we don't allow someone just to like spout abuse on the central line despite how hot it is we do not allow someone to do that and so that same civic response and urgency is what we need for people in the online space because it is being hijacked and weaponized I think also when it comes to tech responsibility 
and take accountability, we as digital citizens also need to know that we can hold them accountable, that they're not exempt, that they are multi-billion pound company, companies um, that have billions of monthly active users. I think Facebook has three point something billion monthly active users, which is more than the population of China and three times the population of Europe. And I think Facebook and Twitter and uh, all these uh, platforms, they've got really good PR around still coming across like they are a small tech company working in their mum's gar garage and they don't know really how to get a grapple with their, with their platform. Like, no, they're multi-billion companies, uh, power companies that have massive tech, tech, key, tech teams that massively um, buy off competition and monopolize the, ma the, the market. Why can't they spend that same, that same vim, take that same energy to looking at their safe, looking at safety, looking at technology that would bring about more uh, safer uses of behavior on the platform? Babe. Sorry, my boyfriend is eating, pot boyfriend, um, eating breakfast on the call. Um, uh, and I think that um, they should spend that, that money looking at safety by design principle. I think a lot of tech platforms have been looking at uh, just prioritizing profit and not seeing the fact that by this exodus of people leaving the online space because it's not safe, um, they're, they're, they are losing out on amazing people being online. They're losing out on amazing innovations and communities and possibilities. And so what's left is the people that we're seeing right now far-right extremists who are operating in closed Facebook groups who are, who are passing on misinformation, disinformation, and it's a shame that it took COVID and the spreading of harmful misinformation um, for platforms to finally take some kind of um, action around um, regulation or, or moderation, I should say, of their, of their platform. And like you said, this laissez-faire approach to their platform is, is massively harmful because the platform has been designed by white men for their friends. And let's never forget that Facebook was first of all designed so that Mark Zuckerberg and his friends could rape women. So that's already at the ethos and the crux of these platforms. And that's why we need to move to a more digital, digital citizenship framework that is about safety by design, is about inclusivity and about understanding how a product that can be rolled out can be really harmful. I can always go, I can go on and on, but I'll give one real example um, that uh, happened recently. Twitter just um, uh, launched a product that allowed you to do voice notes on the, on the app. So if you were an iPhone user, you were the first people to be able to do that. I'm team Samsung and Android, so shout out to anybody who has a Samsung phone. Um, and as soon as they launched the product, we could tell you 10 ways that it was going to be misused um, um, by the misused by the by, by wrong bad actors and how there wasn't a thinking about um, the most marginalized so how deaf communities were going to be alienated by this product how men would use it to be uh, uh, to basically be uh, to basically harass online and um, and send sexualized content which happened as soon one hour from launching that product um, uh, there was hundreds of accounts now sending um, pornographic um, audio to women on the platform. So again, pro products are being designed in 2020 without women and, and diverse communities in mind, and it's causing more harm, which is why we need to start looking at regulation that has an inter intersectional framing. So I think the, the, the rejoinder that always comes, and I always find wildly frustrating, but it comes and it requires us to have a crisp, punchy answer, and I am certain that you have a crisp, punchy answer, but is the boundaries between making our platforms safe and having the platforms policed such that any views that are difficult, challenging, or unpopular also get moved off them. And, you know, if I put my kind of radical hat on, there are, there's a space that you want on these platforms to be able to challenge existing power, right? You want to be able to say, I don't like that statue, um, Black Lives Matter, uh, structural inequality is problematic. 
Um, the rights of LGBTQ community needs to be ardently defended. Um, and we want voices to be able to be robust and angry and outraged. The anger and the outrage when it gets channeled from the right can also be hateful, put people at real risk, um, be proximate to violence. Um, but we've also had some proximity of violence from the left in some ways as well, you know, Shining Path, you know, was not a nice group. So that, how we bound it in a way that we know that we don't want racist, misogynist, homophobic hate speech on the net, but how we bound it with keeping the net something that's a plurality of views and a robust debate seems to me to be a challenge and you always get the hate being pushed, the hate speech being defended in the name of free speech. And that to me frustrates me. So give me the crisp articulation of how you deal with that debate because it's, it's a tough one. Yeah, I get asked that all the time, um, balancing free speech and hate speech and the priority of voices. And I would say that hate speech and online abuse is also um, hindering on the hindering a hindrance to a plurality of voices because you're having people like me and women and non-binary people and trans people not wanting to engage on these platforms because of the hate speech and i think uh free speech needs a needs a really good pr company maybe the person that does work for facebook because free speech gets co-opted by the far right but free speech also works for me and you black lives matter is a is is us exercising free speech and i do you think, you know, 10, 10, 20 years ago, we probably wouldn't have been allowed to say that. We still have the challenge of all, all lives matter as well. Let's not forget that. So what I say to that is, um, is uh, defining the behaviours that we want to encourage and the behaviours that, the red lines that we definitely just do, do not want to tolerate. So hacking, doxing, uh, which is the sharing of um, people's private information, non-consensual photography or revenge porn, as some people call it. Those are real clear tactics that we do not want on our platforms that haven't been rooted out yet. That needs to be dealt with. And then we need to start encouraging behaviors from our online leaders, from our brands who have massive um, amounts of people following them and influence. What behaviors do you wanna be seeing from them? From you know tackling body dysmorphia and body positivity and not selling harmful t uh, top, uh, detox teas, <laughs> for, uh, right to not using your platform to spread hate and misinformation, because there were a lot of people that were saying, oh, COVID doesn't affect black communities. And now look at it, that COVID, COVID disproportionately affects black communities. So there, there needs to be uh, behaviors that we want to be encouraging those with platforms um, and um, especially brands as well. I, I always give Lidl a shout out. Um, I'm a recent convert of Lidl, so I don't have any conflict of interest. They don't give me any freebies, but Lidl um, were using everyday people in their campaigns for their, 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 like, their billboard cam cam campaigns. And one time they used an interracial couple and it and a far right um, speak, uh, a journalist who has a show on talk radio, I'm sure you can guess who I'm talking about. Um, she uh, pointed this out and um, it uh, attracted a lot of um, hate and abuse and Lidl spoke up against it and said like, you're not going to use hate in our name. And the more we could get Nike doing that every time Serena Williams is um, put, put in, an, in, a, in an ad or an endorsement deal, but yet they stay quiet when she's fa facing abuse. Like, it'd be great to hear from Nike, Sainsbury's, Tesco's, you know, all, all platforms that have, all platforms are using everyday people who are engaging the online space, saying that this is the behaviors that we want to be seeing. And then the, and then the same from, from influencers as well, and the same from teachers, the same from uh, executive directors, the same from philanthropists who are, as well who are online. Let's start cultivating the culture we want to see and the behaviors we want to see and the debates we want to see let's get back to having civil debates on our let's let's show that digital citizenship isn't about saying we're all going to agree on stuff like that's not the case black lives matter a lot of black people will use that hashtag but don't agree with what needs to happen to achieve black life black lives mattering right but we have a respectful um civil discussion and dis disagreement online it doesn't venture into calling each other names and being uh, being um homophobic or whatever it is which tends to happen with other kind of debates and i think it got worse 
right, with the EU referendum. No one was displaying civil discussions around the EU referendum and debate. And so I don't feel like we've modelled online to the next generation and mine how to have disagreements online. So I want to blend two questions that have been asked by people who've, who've, um, who are watching. Um, the one is whether you truly think that Facebook and Twitter are ever going to be safe platforms when their business models are predicated on getting as many people onto them as frictionly, frictionlessly as possible and thereby, um, you know, for them regulation is a crimp on profitability. And, and, and then linked to that from Caroline, which is, do you think self-regulation will be sufficient or will governments need to intervene? So can they ever be safe? And B, will they ever be safe by themselves? Or are we going to have to um, force them to be safe by uh, bringing out a stick to sanction them in the form of regulations if they're not? Nope, they're never going to be safe by themselves. We, we try self-regulation for a very, very long time and look where we're at now. We've got a backlog of stuff to be dealing with. So no, I don't think self-regulation will ever work. Basically, am I opti optimistic enough that I think that we could change the platform's d DNA? I have to be, otherwise I wouldn't be on this call, right? <laughs> I have to be, otherwise I wouldn't be here talking about digital citizenship. Um, it's the same with any form of activism, you know, do we really believe we're going to achieve racial equality or equality between the sexes and, and genders and sexuality and, you know, list all the, um, the activist work um, that ha is happening right now as, as, as we speak. It's optimism that kind of keeps us focused and determined. Well, I think what I would love to start seeing though, so we, what, we're not waiting, you know, 50 years for some progress, what I'd love to start seeing is um, consumer choice. So really looking at how we stop Facebook basically being this massive um, monopolizer of the market and it making it very difficult to then say, well, look what your um, peers are doing and be able to use kind of competition within the market. If the market is only one tech company, there's going to be a real problem and a real concern for me and it, and it, scare, it scares me. I think if we're going to see progress happening around changing the DNA anytime soon, we have to find ways to build capacity of everyday people to know that they can challenge tech companies. So you know how we have like voter apathy and there's real like movements to try and address voter apathy around the world. We need those same infrastructure, that same infrastructure and those same organizations doing that for tech companies because how many people who are on this call know that they can hold tech companies to account, know that they, as digital citizens and as users, they can demand more from these platforms. Um, and then I, and then I think we need to have a discussion around what behaviours and norms we want to see. So we never had that conversation before COVID. We never outlined the, the social norms and behaviours we want to see as digital citizens online. And then COVID happened, and online abuse massively increased. Internet usage went through the through the roof, and we um, we now have more victims of online abuse more employers asking their employees to stay at home, but are not providing any guidance, training or support for when they are facing online abuse or to prevent it in the first place, that digital security and self-defense training. Like we haven't got any of that. So if we're gonna make any progress, there's, there's these quick wins, these low hanging fruits that aren't being pulled on yet because we're not seeing tech, uh, accountability, online abuse, online harms as a crisis in our time. I think um, Greta and all those amazing environmentalist activists, what they've done is really put, really change the urgency around tackling climate change. We need that same urgency with tech. Otherwise, this is going to be a sleeping giant um, that is going to, we're, we're going to be like, oh, what happened? How did this happen? But we were all falling asleep, asleep to it. And it starts off with language, you know, not calling the online spaces virtual world or the fake world, like, but, sh but it is an online, it, the online world is an extension of our offline public spaces. It, it, it starts with our words when we, when we don't um, dilute or try to minimize the harms online when someone is facing online abuse and harassment. It's not about saying, oh, go, you know, go take a break or, you know, um, get over yourself or grow thicker skin. Like it's actually making sure that our language also denotes how important this crisis is. And again, us all playing our part as digital citizens to 
amplify the positive behaviors we want to see and also report and stigmatize the behaviors that we don't want to see as well. So let me ask you a question, which is triggered by, again, one of our participants. Um, uh, and it's a sort of subtle question around your first intervention um, about what, what the right role of a bystander is or somebody who acts in solidarity. And let me give you, I think one of the, the, the tricks in this moment is that sometimes we have to be very subtle, but the moment that we're in, and the injustice that people have experienced for centuries and the accentuation of that through corona has caused people to be so angry that having to be subtle is, is hard to ask, right? So, so I'll give you an example. You have an out and out racist neo-Nazi online behaving terribly and what you want is a swarm of people to call them out tell them they're out of line and it's unacceptable and come to the defense of somebody who they have been targeting, right? The second version of it is that you have what I would call your backward racist uncle, who's not a neo-Nazi, who's a little bit ignorant, but you could probably put him on the path of righteousness through some constructive conversations. And you don't want to call him out and cast him into the woods because you can actually take him on a journey, right? But at this moment, trying to judge between who's the Nazi and who's your racist uncle and who should be brought on a journey and who should be put out into the woods is super hard, especially when people are just sick and tired of having to be patient when, you know, black people are just saying, I'm sick and tired of having to be patient. So I don't know how you solve it, but um, tell me your thoughts. Yeah. How do you basically know when to counsel somebody or call them in? Um, and where do you apply grace without that being a burden on you and doing the emotion, emotional labor? Um, I completely get that. And it's not something that applies just to, to, to tech or racism. It, it's, it's everything, right? The, the awakening journey that we are all on. Um, ha, this, is, this is it. This is the, pro, this is the problem. Right? How do you get people to catch up? But you're right that online is particularly hard because you can't see the person, right? So my personal opinion is that you can kind of tell who a troll is and who and somebody who is like misspoken or hasn't got it so when i have so i recently have been kind of talking about how we can't achieve racial uh, justice while being anti-semitic like and and, and and vice versa we can't achieve racial justice for jewish communities if they still don't, if they don't address anti-blackness in their community. So for the last three weeks, you can imagine what my mentions have been like. It's been ridiculous. And there's some people that I will look at their accounts and I will first of all see when their account was made and if they have a profile photo. If their account was made in June 2020 and they've got a photo of Donald Trump, I don't think you want to have a nuanced conversation about Black Lives Matter or anti-Semitism, right? But if it's somebody that I've known that follows me, uh, we've agreed on many things in the past or had a respectful conversation and disagreed in the past and definitely just doesn't understand what's going on here and there, I, I would either reply to them, um, uh, so I'm not quote tweeting them and therefore encouraging this potential pile on because my followers still need to come in my defense, I either reply to them or take it to the DMs, uh, direct message. So I think that's when you can kind of uh, put a bit of a criteria in place to see who is worth kind of doing that extra work with and call, and call them in and somebody who just wants to troll you. Um, I, I, I also think that um, when someone is being attacked by a troll, their MO for trolls, right? Like, especially when, they, when it's kind of like mob style trolling, where they put the link on a Reddit thread and are directing their people to come to you or sadly this happens with mumsnet and uh, and trans activists their accounts get put on mumsnet's forums and then mumsnets go and troll them around um trans rights issues so um uh what i say there is the the mo of a tr of, of mob style trolling is to dilute the original message so if you see someone being abused abused that's why we've got reply. And I'll can send a link around. It's, it's reply, amplify, support, and report. Amplify the original message because when you 
focus on the abuse and the and, and the disagreement it, it's doing exactly what most of these trolls want which is to uh, overshadow your original message by you talking about black lives matter and then they're now engaging with you about all lives matter you are now helping that algorithm algorithm you're helping now the algorithm make that all lives matter trend you're now distracting from black lives matter you're now exhausted that's exactly what they wanted you to distract right i don't know if there's anyone who's anyone who's um Christian or read the Bible, but the, the way that the Bible defines the devil is to kill, steal, and destroy. And that's exactly how I would describe a troll. So when you, rather than going to attack the person who's potentially made the mistake or misspoken or is potentially a, a, a massive troll, amplify the original message. Even if you disagree, again, that's modeling like a civil disagreement. Like, I don't agree with your message, but really, really, really made me think about X, Y, and Z. Amplify the original message rather than the trolling and the negative behavior. I have a, um, Ali has a question. It says, isn't one of the key challenges the ease with which you can create a pseudonym or a fake profile? Anonymity is key to, pe is key to people and people are emboldened by. I get asked this question a lot. And Ali, when the trolling happened to me three years ago, I was like, everybody needs to reveal who they are right now. Who are you? Where do you live? Like I wanted, I was not for anonymity at all, but I had to go on a journey and I, and that's where intersectionality comes in and also being an internationalist and working with our global South partners, anonymity and being able to be anonymous or use pseudonames is a lifeline to these groups in the global south who are trying to fight for their freedoms who are trying to challenge their governments who are being whistleblowers anonymity in itself isn't bad it's that again like free speech bad actors have been using it for bad behavior so do i think there's a ways that we should be um trying to bring back anonymity for those that really need it yes does that mean trying technology like using um yoti app for in uh, for example where it's just like age age verification in a very encrypted and safe way should we be trialing that online so that the this machine encrypted machine has can verify who we are the platforms don't have our data or have any more of our data and where anonymous trolls can then for when they break the law their information can easily be given to the government but then you have a problem of what well, if your government and your and and the tech company are hands in hands are in cahoots with each other and will do something na naughty with it so it anonymity is, is really hard but i am at the point of going from being really against it to really understanding its power to now thinking okay we have to start experimenting with different way, different ways of protecting anonymity so let me ask a final question because we're wow, gone so fast. Um, Leon Lewis asks, he says, I absolutely agree that everybody has a responsibility to stand up to abuse, but I'm also aware that there has been significant criticism of white knights coming to the defense of people from minority communities. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah. Um, my thoughts are you have to my thoughts are asking the person sometimes, what is it you want them to do? So I think, um, like I said, retweeting the original message and amplifying their voices is really what people want right now. They want to speak with holding the mic for themselves, not somebody holding the mic to their, to their mouths. And like I said before, no group is, a, is homogeneous. People are individuals and want support and, um, uh, allyship in different ways. So if you want to do something that's quite public and, 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 and on a platform, write to them, DM them. I had people do that to me. I'm very clear about my online boundaries as somebody who champions digital self-care. So I had people ask me, is it okay to share the petition? Is it okay to do this? People ask me if that's something I want to do because they also realize that their amplification to their followers could bring more abuse to me, right? So I think just having that conversation about what is the support you need. And sometimes you asking that gets that person to really reflect, okay, what is it that I need? I haven't thought through what is it that I emotionally, physically, financially, mentally need. And actually giving them that reflective space might be really, really helpful. Um, and I think it's really important that we are mindful of that during COVID-19 and the fact that Black Lives Matter has brought this global introspection for all of us to think about how we do better as philanthropists, charity CEOs, employers, um, activists, journalists, you name it. And particularly in COVID with the fact that like 
our survey that we have out and we really encourage people on this call to, to fill it in and to share it. Um, is for us to track the impact of COVID-19 on, on and, and tech abuse. We've seen a 91% in people in respondents saying that they've, you, they've increased their internet usage and 41% say they've now experienced online abuse. That's almost half. And almost 30% have said that the online abuse they've experienced has increased during COVID. So us understanding how we can be better digital citizens to each other and having each other's backs and being allies is really important being open to making mistakes and being um and, and having to say sorry is really also really important because this is all new territory for us because we're having to learn these new behaviors ourselves well i think that's a beautiful note upon which to end i may, may say on a personal note i feel incredibly blessed to have the conduit um benefit from having you as an impact fellow and uh and as and as a person who is uh um you know a part of the community and then i and i know both london and the world benefits from from you um i'm also going to set a personal goal in 2020 of getting idris elba to follow you yes. <laughs> um, so so we, we we have to conspire to make that happen but um thank you for everything that you do can't wait to see you back in the building and uh, for everybody who's listened in go on to glitch follow Shay uh, and uh, let's keep supporting this in very important cause. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Ciao, ciao. Stay safe and stay well. Bye.